be a success is when there were some kids that would show up outside the, the studio door. And and I'm just wondering if there are any of those grown up kids here? Oh yeah. Oh really? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they were there forty six years ago standing outside the, the studio door and and so I have to ask this how how many of the rest of you were kids who ran home from school to watch the show? Okay, no, wait, oh, you are older than I am. I mean, not, but you know what? Uh, that's fair enough because uh, from the very beginning, Dark Shadows had a very broad based, multi generational audience. And it came on at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, which meant that a lot of housewives already had the dinner in the oven, and college professors were done for the day, college kids were back in their dorms. Uh, Telephone operators, cab drivers, nurses—you know—they they could all take a little <coughs> break and uh, and watch Dark Shadows. And um, the other thing, uh, because that really uh, set us apart from the other soaps. In its heyday, Dark Shadows had an audience of 20 million people, which you know far out did Secret Storm and Guiding Light. Yeah. But the other thing, and and Debbie reminded me of this, is that. Um, the other thing that set us apart from all of the other soaps is something that today we call merch. Because as soon as Dark Shadows started to take off, we were on lunch boxes and those little, you know, Viewmaster things, and we were comic strips, we were paper dolls, we were, uh, we were books. Uh, Quentin's theme was in the top ten of the hit parade when there was such a thing as a hit parade. <laughs> and uh, and my, my own personal favorite is that I was a Josette bobblehead. Oh, yeah. um, so I still have a Josette bobblehead on the corner of my desk that, you know, just agrees with everything. <laughs> um, but this all started uh, in, in the spring of 1966 when Dan Curtis, who created Dark Shadows, assembled this company of actors, uh, among them a movie star, Joan Bennett, and, uh, <laughs> and Grayson Hall, who was uh, an Academy Award nominee for Night of the Iguana, and all of these other wonderful veteran actors, and then a bunch of us who had just graduated from drama school, like Kate Jackson and, and me. And um, my funny friends over here, I uh, know that when Dan Curtis hired me to play Maggie Evans, the, the fast-talking waitress in the College Court Diner, um, I was already moonlighting as a Playboy Bunny. And, uh, and I kept working as a Playboy Bunny for at least another month after Dark Shadows was on the air because I called my mother in Robinsdale, Minnesota, and I, and I told her I, I was on this new television series. And, uh, and and I told her it was called Dark Shadows, and she said, well, I never heard of it. And I said, no, 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 Mom, it's new. And she said, well, you never know how these things are going to turn out, so I wouldn't give up my bunny job just yet. You don't want to be left without, her exact words. So because I didn't want to be left without, I kept working at the Playboy Club until one Saturday night when, when two couples came in, and sat at one of my tables in the party room, and I introduced myself as, you know, good evening, I'm your bunny Kay. <laughs> and, um, and this woman looked up at me and she said, aren't you Maggie Evans? <laughs> 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 what are you doing working as a Playboy? <laughs> so that was the Saturday night when I turned in my bunny ears for keeps, but not my friendships with these <laughs> wonderful <laughs> people. <laughs> that, that lasts forever. And, and it wasn't long after I was hired uh, and the show got off to a, a pretty good start. Uh, you know, we started in black and white and then we went to color and it was right before we went to color that Dan Curtis had this brilliant idea of bringing aboard Jonathan Frith and, uh, to create his iconic role of Barnabas Collins. And there he was that first day, you know, with the, the big gob of a ring and the cape and the silver wolf head cane, and we thought, oh, there go our careers. Uh, <laughs> we were doing a ghost story. And, uh, but but uh, anything but, because uh, Jonathan Fridge saved our bacon. Uh, it was when Jonathan came on the show that everything took off. And at that point, we were dealing with not just a vampire, 
but also ghosts and werewolves and uh, and a phoenix and uh, and Crazy Jenny is Marie Wallace here. Marie Wallace came on board as Crazy Jenny, and uh, and she was a Broadway star. She was in Gypsy, um, and as most of you know, uh, Barnabas Collins was smitten with Maggie Evans. So. That meant that for uh, oh, for the longest time, I would be uh, walking down endless corridors, you know, with cobwebs and smoke and mist. We have this um, we have this funny little machine that you, you poured in this this stuff that it smelled like cheap bubble gum, but it made clouds of cobwebs. And we had a um, dry ice machine with a fan on it. These were really cutting edge special effects. Uh, and we also we also had a prop man who would stand with a fishing pole and there was a string and a little bat and he'd just shake that. Um, but anyway, I, uh, endless, endless shows where I was saying, Barnabas, Barnabas, come to me. Uh, and then one day I showed up at the, at the studio and I wasn't working that day, but I stopped by just to pick up some scripts and and I saw the producer and the wardrobe woman uh, clothing this dress dummy. They were putting um, uh, this shredded dress on her and a, and a wig, and there was some green light, there was a fan. And, and I said, what is that? And they said, that's the corpse of Josette Dupre. <laughs> and she is the fiance of the vampire, and she has jumped off Widow's Hill. What do you think? And I said, looks like a clothes dummy. And uh, for that, I got to stand in for the clothes dummy. And uh, which was kind of fun, because I, I put on this raggedy dress, and, and they, they took the wig, and they dipped it in baby oil, and then smooshed it with talcum powder. And, and I wore that. Uh, and, um, and then the makeup man, uh, he drew an eyeball on a half a ping pong ball. and he. <laughs> stuck that to my cheek. And so I, I stood on this um, this platform and with a fan coming in, of course, that made my eyes water so I looked like I was crying. And then I lifted my arms beseechingly and then I opened my mouth in a silent scream. And of course, Dan Curtis loved it. <coughs> so I said, Dan, do I get paid extra? <laughs> and he said, no, we can still use the clothes dummy. <laughs> But anyway, I, I stood in for the clothes dummy uh, several more times for free. And but the thing is, it, it got me the role of Josette Dupre. And so I became the first of all of the Dark Shadows actors to play multiple roles in a different time period. This was an extraordinary opportunity for all of us young drama students who, you know, you learn to do Shakespeare and restoration comedy. But for your first job, you know, to, to be doing costume drama, it was, it was just an amazing experience. And uh, the other, of course, downside is that when we really got into the paranormal, supernatural stuff, um, we lost a little bit of uh, uh, rehearsal time that we really had. It was all given over to special effects. So, um, and by the way, uh, Gabrielle and Judith <coughs> Patkin are here. And they are the granddaughters of Jake Lepeck and our, our beloved technical director. And, uh, and, and he just passed away in December, and he was such a lovely man. But uh, they, uh, they're hearing this story for the first time. But I would hear this disembodied voice from the control booth <laughs> saying, and he always called me Katie, Katie, wait until you see the hand coming up out of the grave, count to two, turn into camera three, and scream. <laughs> <laughs> those, those are the kinds of notes we get.